senior editor with foreign policy, uh, the publication uh, uh, in Washington, D.C., has taken a keen interest in Xinjiang and the Uyghurs for many years. Um, on my left, um, Rahima uh, Mahmoud, uh, who is a musician and translator, award-winning translator, in fact. She won the English Pen Prize for her translation of The Land Drenched in Tears, uh, born in Xinjiang. Uh, but has lived in the UK for many years and is now a prominent voice on behalf of the Uyghurs and human rights activist. So um, we're going to be talking for a bit and then uh, we will hope to hear from you. Um, and we have a fair, um, a fair stretch of time, but I wanted to start, James. Um, I'm not sure how many people are really familiar with the kind of tangled history of Xinjiang and, and of the Uyghur population and its relationship to China. So perhaps you could start us off. Why, indeed, is um, Xinjiang so far beyond the Great Wall considered always to have been part of China? Well, basically because the Chinese government considers everything that the Qing Empire ruled to have been part of China. Um, uh, for those who don't know that the, the Qing the Empire was Manchu dynasty, and... Yeah. The, mm. And because the, the Qing were big participants, like many of the empires that sort of ruled, uh, ruled China have been, they were big participants in Central Asian politics and culture. They inherited, as well as the sort of Chinese imperial legacy, they inherited the uh, Chinggisid legacy, the sort of legacy of the Mongols of imperial power. And so they expanded quite considerably to the West. So you have this big area that at various points had been under uh, different forms of imperial influence and control, um, like other bits of Central Asia over the years, but that was not historically or culturally signified. And the Qing, as they did with other parts of their empire, maintained a fairly loose sort of hands-off policy that is accompanied by great spurts of imperial violence, um, but were happy to keep these sort of frontier areas uh, un, un Chinese, as it were, unsinicized. Um, and let people pretty much alone. <coughs> now, by the beginning of the 20th century, you're starting to see the Chinese develop an identity as a modern nation state. We're including notions of clear borders, including notions um, of uh, ethnic unity, cultural control, this kind of thing. Uh, in response to that, a uh, very clear Uyghur identity begins to develop. And the Uyghur are people who have uh, lived there for many centuries. Um, the idea, like, like other nations, like other, like other peoples, they start to develop a much clearer sense of themselves as a people, as, an, as a, a national identity in the uh, early 20th century. And so, so that's as opposed to subjects of the emperor? Or as opposed part to subjects of the, of the empire, or the tribe, or the family, or the people. It's not that, not, that, not that they weren't a people before, but the idea of being a nation comes up very strongly, as it does... Um, with, with other peoples, with, and in many ways with the Chinese themselves, the idea of there being a sort of uh, a, a China rather than different empires. So you get, uh, and uh, they model themselves, we, um, Uyghur intellectuals, Uyghur um, activists and politicians model themselves in the emerging national movements elsewhere, and they create, the, they create um, an ambition to be a state called uh, Turkestan or East Turkestan. So they identify very much as part of this sort of pan-Turkic group, this, this great sort of spreading of cultures across Eurasia. And this is increasingly in opposition with what the, Chine with the, what the Chinese want. The Chinese want um, a China with clear borders that includes Xinjiang. Right through the 30s and 40s, it's this big, confused, chaotic area where lots of warlords and um, local politicians and local leaders compete for control. Then the, um, the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese army, uh, enters in what's called the, uh, the Peaceful March, as, a, as in the Peaceful Liberation of Tibet. Everything the Chinese army does is peaceful. Eventually, it'll be the peaceful invasion of Taiwan. And they, um, uh, they crush local opposition, as they have done elsewhere. They impose the new communist order. But at first, this order is very distinctly communist. It's very distinctly modeled on the Soviet Union. The new China is supposed to be uh, a socialist nation state um, that is multicultural, that is made up of many different minorities, um, 
and that it has room for the languages and cultures of all these peoples. Now, as with the Soviet Union, of course, in practice, that, equ that generally equates to squashing the local minorities because they're a source of possible independence or rebellion movements, and the, the dominance of Han Chinese culture and the Chinese language. But there's this ideological space for the Uyghur to exist. There are Uyghur language schools, uh, there's Uyghur culture, there's Uyghur poetry. All these kind of things have some possible space within the, the PRC in the first decades of its existence. And they are set up as an autonomous region? Yes, in the same way as so you have sort of, in the same way as, you know, the, the Soviets had, um, had sort of the Kazakhs or the Uzbeks or these, these peoples that were supposed to maintain a separate identity as nations within the Soviet system, right. so were the Uyghur. And in fact, until the 1980s, the, in translation, the Chinese term was translated as, ne uh, for an ethnic group, that's now translated as ethnic group, was translated as nation. Uh, they switched that in 83 or so. Okay, so, so here we have um, a large group of people and a territory. They don't speak Chinese. They have a different cultural history and of relatively recent incorporation. Mm -hmm. So, Rahima, when you were, you were born in Xinjiang, when you were at school, when you were growing up, what did you learn about the history of the Uyghur and, and the People's Republic? Well, obviously, in China, you don't really, you cannot really learn the truth. <laughs> the but what did you learn? Like what were you taught? But what I, my own experience is that my family, my parents didn't speak a word of Chinese. And uh, we had uh, some neighbors who were, uh, who uh, came like maybe 50, 60 years before I was born, and they spoke uh, Uyghur language. There are quite a lot of Manju lived, uh, lived in that, uh, the village where I lived. And later, in 1980s, I moved to, to the city. Even in the city, there wasn't enough, uh, there wasn't a lot of Chinese, the city of Holja. Mm -hmm. and, but the population increased is really, really fast. That's with the incoming closing. migration from yes, Han at Chinese. At that time, yeah. the Chinese, if they, uh, even when I, when I was a child, if the Chinese people didn't speak the Uyghur language, especially in the villages or the rural area, area they couldn't survive because they're just uh, Uyghur people didn't speak the Chinese. Chinese. But uh, 10 years later, it's completely the other way around. So does that mean that when you went to school, your, your, the, the, the medium of tuition was, was Uyghur rather than, than Han Chinese? Or yes, Han yes. Chinese? Um, yeah. We had a choice, uh, and I believe like one in 10, maximum one in 10 Uyghur, or one in maybe 50 went to the Chinese school. I was one of that one in 50 <laughs> Uyghur who chose to uh, go to the uh, Chinese school, and so my father was very angry when I when I when I made the decision when I was so little. He he was angry because he he was worried that I will just become like a Chinese. He will uh, he was scared that I will lose my identity. And so, That's in terms of of maintaining that that different identity, that cultural identity. How was that for you as, as a young person in Xinjiang? You know, because there are very different religious practices, there are different um, views on, on food, clearly. Um, wh how was, th was it relatively okay at that point to practice? Yes, because we were, uh, I mean, the, the uh, dominant per people at that time, I remember I in primary school, in, in number 15, when I, when I well, 15 primary school in, in the city, when I moved there, uh, uh, year five, and then there was a, a school next door, that secondary school. And any time when I was working with, with the Chinese students, young students, and when they saw a group of Uyghur, and then they always ran, said, Long la la la, like a wolf is coming, they kind <laughs> of, like, <laughs> they were a bit worried. Well, I mean, uh, there wasn't any kind of conflicts between, between Uyghurs or, or the Han Chinese, especially the, the Han people who uh, came very uh, long time ago. They understood the culture, the, 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 the religious practice. And uh, when we went out for food, they, I mean, 
from my own experience, they wouldn't even in poke in front of me. That was how much uh, respect that uh, they showed. But that changed, and uh, now they're forcing people to, 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 to eat. Yes. So, so at that time, was there a memory in your family or in the people that your, that your family knew of a desire for an independent? Uh, we no were, uh, no uh, one dared to talk about independence were you because aware I was that born after, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, that cultural revolution. Uh, I was born in uh, the 70s and then uh, when I started uh, school, uh, Mao died. That was a year that 76. Mao, Mao, yeah, mm -hmm. 76, Mao died. And then people still had that kind of fear of talking anything, speaking anything. I remember the, those prisoners who served... Uh, 20 years in prison in Tarim uh, returned at that time. Uh, uh, people often spoke about why they were imprisoned. There were some, some people served so many years because they wrote one poem and it was a, they were accused of being a, a nationalist or pan-Turkist, something like that. So um, my father used to read uh, the uh, books. Uh, I think... Uh, only um, there were books that was like uh, they kept very secretly. It wasn't allowed. But in eighty things changed, and just like it happened to all over China, that the great that liberal were, decade of the eighties. Yes, 80s, yes. Yeah. So we had all these great writers like Abraham Utkur, Zordan Saber, Zordan Saber managed to write um, uh, on a yurt, uh, motherland. And uh, uh, Abdraim Utgur wrote two books, but uh, when he decided to write the third book, then the 90s started, the, the, the crackdown started. So, so what, what impression that, f that great flowering in the 80s of, of cultural freedom, did that, did that change the way people felt about their situation? Did it make it better? Did it make it... Worse, what? No, I think the more people, oh, they always had that desire, but it's the fear, the fear that people couldn't really express the desire. But in the 80s, people had a little bit of freedom that they feel they can say things, they can talk. Um, and uh, they also felt there is, especially after the collapse of the Soviet, you know, they, and, and then, well, indeed, uh, yes. you know, they, they had this kind of, um, optimism, I would say, that maybe mm -hmm. we can also uh, separate, you know, we can, we can have our own separate state. But I don't think they had uh, any kind of um, um, plan or anything that would fight the Chinese or go, go to war or something like that. So it wasn't yeah. an active project? It no, was it, was, it wasn't. It's more of a peaceful struggle. Okay. But, James, there were people in exile in Istanbul all through this time who, yeah. who did, or did at one point, have an active project. They did, and you, you had a couple of fairly isolated cases, for instance, of a Uyghur fighting with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan in the 80s, who had well, the, yes. crossed the border and so on. But this was always a very small, I mean, a very, very small minority. Um, but there, there was the idea of sort of um, statehood I think the idea of the, or the possibility of state becomes much more powerful at this time, much more common. Um, but even, I don't think even at this point, but of course you know this much more directly than I do, I, I think many Uyghur just envis also envisaged the ability to live more freely, to live better lives, even within the PRC, to, to be Uyghur within a bigger to, in a state. Maybe to want independence or statehood as a theoretical possibility, in the future, but not as something that was necessarily around the corner or Im even achievable in their lifetimes. Sure. So we've talked about about Chinese moving into Xinjiang. I mean, and I I seem to remember a lot of that was organised by the army in sort of these Bing Tuan, these mm -hmm. colonisation projects. Um, but Uyghur moving moving east uh, must also have been a yeah, phenomenon because that's where the jobs were. Indeed, um, and so you had. Uh, very large numbers of Uyghur, more in the more in the 90s and the early 2000s than the 80s as such, moving out of Xinjiang and taking jobs in other parts of China, participating in Chinese life. But one of the one of the, the difficulties in terms of integration has always been not just language, but that the Uyghur look different from Han Chinese. 
So most of the Chinese minorities, uh, the idea of this being a single Han Chinese people in the first place is a fiction, that genetically, culturally, there's all, any number of differences, like with most peoples. But most of, even of the minorities um, are not immediately identifiable as being minorities. If you see, um, if you see a Hui, for instance, uh, an Eastern Chinese Muslim, they look, because they are in most cases just uh, Han Chinese who whose families converted to Islam um, centuries ago. Or if, even if you see some of the, the sort of Southeast Asian um, sort of peoples from the, the, the mountain areas, from the, the borderlands, they maybe look a little bit Southeast Asian, but, they, but you'll, you'll see plenty of Han who, who are also sort of a little bit smaller and a little bit darker than the average Han. But the Uyghur are very dis uh, generally very distinctively Central Asian looking. Um, and they're taller, uh, taller the, the, um, they, they appear exotic to Han Chinese eyes. And so what this meant was as Uyghur moved out, they also started to encounter some of the problems that minorities, particularly identifiable minorities, face everywhere. So for instance, um, crime in China is almost all run by uh, ethnic or provincial association. So if you have a gang in Beijing or in Shanghai, it's a gang made up of people from Hebei or a gang made up of people from one town in Shandong. Or Who specialize kind of in different types of crime. Who specialize yes. in different types of crime. Now, but for the most part, 95% of these people were, were Han Chinese or other minorities, but because the Uyghurs stood out, they became very associated in Chinese eyes with criminal activity. And the reputation of the Uyghurs being criminals and as being threatening became quite strong among the Han. So I know lots of people who were warned against the Uyghur when they were young because the Uyghur were supposed to be dangerous, they were supposed to be thieves, they were supposed to... They all, um, traditionally, Uyghur carry a knife for sort of general use, you know, cutting food up and so on. Um, and the, this association of knives and, you know, they did knife crime. They were, so you, you see a lot of the sort of same things that were applied to, say, Hispanic immigrants in America in the, in the 50s, you know, these kind of young, kind of a little sort of macho, threatening. All these sort of stereotypes were very much pushed onto Uyghur as they moved into the rest of China. But at the same time, there was also assimilation. There were also... I've known, um, I've known several people who are the product of, ma of happy marriages between a Han, Han parent and a Uyghur parent. Of, I, know Han who, I know Han Chinese who became deeply interested in Uyghur culture and went to study it, went to learn it, were committed to the music, to the language. Uh, I know many, um, and many Uyghur who in turn um, saw themselves as being in some way Chinese or certainly loved Chinese music or loved Chinese poetry or loved any of these things. There was a lot of... Um, there was a lot of happy exchange as well as difficulties. And uh, there were institutions which, I mean, still exist, like the, mi the minorities' universities in which mm. culture was taught and exchanged. And, and I, I mean, there was quite a presence of Uyghur in Beijing at there one was. point. There was a big um, was Uyghur community there, both in, in terms of... Um, you had a lot of migrants who were not officially registered there, um, who often uh, sold um, cake on the streets. So, um, and you had the, um, they took over the heroin trade in Beijing in the early 2000s um, uh, from the West Africans, which was a, f um, a f strange little, sorry, the West Africans took over the heroin trade from them, yeah. um, from Uyghur gangs in the early 2000s. But then you also had tons of Uyghur who were um, just, you know, working in computer firms or sure. working for the government, all this kind of thing. So, so I want to go back, though, to, to the end of the 80s, Rahima, because you come from a place where there was a very serious incident after Tiananmen. Can you tell us about that? And, and um, was that well, the first uh, of that kind? No, I must say, uh, I went to Dalian University of Technology to do petrochemical engineering, actually, from 1987. We should also perhaps say that there's <laughs> a lot of oil in Xinjiang, one oh, of the he, reasons yeah, they yeah. hang on to it. Yeah. Yes, my experience in Dalian was was actually very it's unforgettable. It was a beautiful, beautiful time. And I didn't really face any kind of, I mean, discrimination or anything. It's more like what James X described. It's like, wow, Xinjiang. Yeah. Oh, how Xinjiang Kunyang. Right. It's like that. And, uh, and, was, and, was and quite, for you, quite you like were one of those people who saw a, an opportunity in the larger pool and that you could right. get an education and you could have a career. 
Yeah, even then, when I, uh, when we, for the university entry exam, and at that time I actually, only then I realized how bad the, this uh, institutional discrimination is, because for the Uyghurs were only given uh, like quarters of numbers of people, uh, students can go to certain universities. And th at the time, uh, I didn't have any other choice. The f one was Beijing uh, Medical University. They only could recruit 10 minority students from whole Xinjiang. And uh, you have to be top 10 in whole Xinjiang. And then the second came, uh, Dalian uh, University of Technology. They had 40, uh, 40 p students. So I managed to get in that, 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 uh, that number. But uh, in 1989, I was also at Tiananmen Square. Um, that's another kind of experience that I have witnessed that, that kind of shaped my, uh, my belief or my very big disappointment of this uh, you know, uh, communist government, how brutal that you know, it, it can be. And then I uh, returned and back to my country in 1992. And I thought I can very easily find a very good job in Urumqi. I wanted to remain in, 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 uh, in Urumqi. But sadly, uh, I just couldn't find a job anywhere. When I co made a phone call, and they were very much interested because I spoke Chinese so well because from the primary school I studied. and then. Uh, when I went for interview straight away, there is uh, some kind of excuses, and they knew, they found out that I am not a Chinese. So then, uh, in the end, one month later, I took a job in another town, which is mainly like petrochemical jobs. So uh, it was that was in 19, 1992, and when I um, started working, I realized the the. Uh, petrochemical plant where I worked, there were 3,500, over 3,500 employees, and there were only just over 300 minorities. So the, uh, about like 10%, even less than 10%. They're and not at that important. point, the population roughly would have been 40% minority, All the 50%. good jobs, petrochemical industry, any, any jobs that you have much better, higher uh, wages, you have very, very, very few workers who are employed there. Mm -hmm. It's um, very difficult, too, for uh, Uyghurs to stay in hotels in a lot of China. Yes, um, they very, I mean, yeah. I'm sure. I can, I can, I can, I can, I can tell you my experience. And uh, when I was studying in in Dalian, I didn't have that problem, but I that happened during the 90s. In 1998, I was sent to study hotel management in uh, Guang, uh, Guangdong, Guangzhou University, and um, I had to change a train at uh, Henan, Hebei Province, and I went to five different hotels. And uh, um, after I showing my ID card, they wouldn't they wouldn't take me. And I had my teacher's certificate. I was lecturer at that time in 1998. So I, I showed my my teacher's certificate. I said, "Look, I teach people like you. I teach Chinese students. How dare you don't you don't you don't you you don't?" And eventually, I, uh, one hotel accepted me after I had a huge uh, uh, debate, not argument, kind of debate. And uh, uh, then uh, I said, we cannot uh, give you a, a room, but you have to share with someone. And the person I shared with, <laughs> she was a she's police woman. <laughs> so, what an astonishing coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we became very good friends overnight. <laughs> <laughs> so we come back to the, the what happened, uh, the, 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 the really terrible thing uh, in Holja, my, my uh, city. I think that was in 1997. Yes. Um, tell, tell, tell us about, about, that, uh, about that incident. Incident is putting it mildly. But. Yes. Um, I think after, the ni after 95, especially, I mean, between uh, 90 to 95, that, that period, was still kind of well, but n there wasn't any major incidents 
there wasn't ma many ma major incidents. But we heard about small uh, kind of re rebel or uh, small uh, number of people uh, protested um, for greater freedom. But in Rulja, that was the time, 97 winter, I was on my vacation with my son. And suddenly, this protest uh, took place. That was on the 5th of February. I remember just like yesterday. And uh, um, I heard from, from my friends and relatives, uh, there, because there were a lot of uh, Uyghur uh, religious clerics uh, were arrested. And one among them was my uh, sister-in-law's husband uh, was arrested as well. Police just somehow, there are uh, uh, these, what you call um, the religious, um, do you call it scholar or the Talib? Mm -hmm. it, they come from uh, uh, Afghanistan or Pakistan somewhere. Uh -huh. Mysteriously, they can, they, can, they can arrive there, there's no problem. And then uh, they organize a kind of uh, religious uh, preaching meeting. And they have these young men uh, go there, and it's a kind of house uh, gathering. And then about half an hour later, police would arrive and then take, take them away. Mm. So the, uh, there were hundreds arrested. Uh, when I uh, arrived, Rulja, that was around be beginning of um, February, and I heard that there were about uh, 150 Uyghur young men already being taken away. Uh, they were mostly actually from, from villages. And on that day, on the 5th of uh, February, uh, about around 200 Uyghur, uh, mainly male, uh, gathered in the in a, in a, a city of Khulja, and then they uh, just peaceful march, had a um, banner that um, practicing religion is not a crime. And also there were like uh, some football clubs were also uh, forced to dis, uh, disperse. Mm -hmm. So they also had a banner like uh, playing football is not, not, uh, not crime. And also the Meshrep was banned. Meshrep is, is a very traditional Uyghur uh, party. Uh, the, it has a very strict rule uh, rooted from the Islamic culture. And uh, in, this is a very important part of the Uyghur, uh, especially for male. Uh, Amashrab is very important because especially in, in winter, uh, in villages, Amashrab is very popular because um, it's a, we call it 30, 30 men's gathering. Like a, a, and it's a, a very entertaining, and a, 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 because winter is very, very cold in, a, in the and country. And you have sort of, you know, you have barbecue, and you yeah. see, and you sort of sing songs together, and it's very, it's very kind of male bondy. Yes, you know, yes, yeah, yes, yes, and it's also very important uh, because the measure became very. Um, popular at that time because Uyghurs also want to fight uh, drug and alcoholism. And uh, a Meshrep is whoever uh, participate Meshrep, they, can, they are not allowed to drink mm -hmm. or take any kind of, uh, the, the more kind of, okay. uh, yeah, proper Uyghur way of living. So anyway, that, that was, uh, uh, that Meshrep was banned. So also said Meshrep is not a crime. And for that, um, but during the march, thousands joined, you know, people who are just closing down, closing their shops, and that was also winter vacation, and uh, it was just before the Chinese New Year, uh, 5th of February, one of the most coldest uh, days. And uh, police didn't um, in interfere them until they gathered in front of the government building, the, the, it, we call it a square, and uh, uh, they waited for people assemble, as many as possible. And uh, then they actually uh, was waiting, they were waiting, deployed military from Boyandai, they, 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 no, it's about uh, 15, uh, 20 minutes mm -hmm. drive. Mm -hmm. So the military came in mm -hmm. and opened fire and then started arresting people. And they 
visited homes one by one. They had photographs and videos of people who uh, 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 went for the, went to this demonstration. Mm -hmm. A lot of young men, just because they uh, resembled the, the the person on the photo or mm -hmm. on the video, because mm -hmm. for Chinese the Uyghurs, they say they look all the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, I mean, I, I'm laughing, but it's a very, very sad. I it was, I think, in total, four to five thousand young men and uh, some women were arrested at that time. So, James, that that kind of sequence of events, I mean, sounds like a provocation. I, I mean, it, you know, you the the Talib arrive, the, the police arrive shortly afterwards, there's, a, there's an incident, there's a response predictively, and then there's a crackdown. One of the things, of course, which is extremely disputed is how much of a problem there is in Xinjiang, how radical is, is Xinjiang. And this is at a time when um, radical Islam is appearing elsewhere, when you know the war in Afghanistan has been going on for some time. As you say, Uyghurs uh, were detained. And in fact, there were Uyghurs in Guantanamo Bay for, for some time. There are not many. I mean, it, it's a very difficult thing to untangle. Mm. But, but one side says, we are dealing with a terrorist problem. And the other side says, we are fighting for freedom and this is a peaceful fight. So where do we, where do we sit here? I think it's undeniable that there's been some radicalization within the Uyghur community. I think that that radicalization has been largely the response uh, to extremely heavy-handed and brutal Chinese policies. Um, that, and in particular, as peaceful alternatives were destroyed, as people who looked for a peaceful way to coexist with the Chinese were imprisoned or um, removed or banned from speaking, uh, radicalization became the only option. Uh, and it seems to have, in the, in the early 2000s, as best we know, and I should emphasize that everything, our access to Xinjiang is incredibly poor. Um, it's very hard. Journalists can go there, but they're, very, but they're watched, they're very limited, it, even more today, incredibly limited. Um, there, there were, China says that there was a movement called the uh, East, East Turkestan uh, Islamic Movement, Etim. Etim. Yeah. which doesn't seem to have really existed or seems to have existed very briefly. Well, the and State Department labelled it a the terrorist State Department organization. Labeled a terrorist organization cause, because some you know, intern at the State Department pulled up a list um, and, they were, trying to, and yeah. they were trying to be, be nice with the Chinese uh, post-9-11. Like, you know, the, there's no... S there appear to have been some later groups which almost adopted some, some kind of elements of this because the Chinese created the sort of idea that there was an organized movement. And some people were like, that sounds great. Where can I, you know, I, I hate the Chinese. But very visibly, um, w particularly young Uyghur men started to become, I think, in the 2000s, as a result of these policies, much more anti-Chinese, much um, not, I think, necessarily radicalized in any sort of Islamist sense, but um, in terms of the, the sense that they were fighting for their own identity. You started to get, for instance, uh, East Turkestan flags being produced and hit, um, kept in households hit, uh, hidden, um, which was a huge risk. People were taking on a huge commitment, um, and you had, and you, um, I think you had a small number of people who who were involved in, in basically insurgency. Now that number later on, I think, seems to have radically grown as um, oppression after. 2009 in particular starts to mm -hmm. uh, become far, far worse, and the options for Uyghur become smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, 2000. So, so we'll we'll we'll, we'll come we'll to 2009. To that, yes. So, but but just to kind of frame this, so we have the collapse of the Soviet Union, the emergence of the Stans, the neighbors who, and the, and of course there is no Uyghur Stan, um, but the Kazakhs and the and, and the Kyrgyz and other minorities actually in Xinjiang have suddenly got a, an independent state, a national state, next door. The Uyghurs don't. Um, then we have 9-11 and, the, and the, the lowering of any barriers to, if you like, taking a firm hand with a, with a, 
a, a Muslim yes, um, population in, in internationally. Of, you, you get 9-11 also produces, and the invasion of Iraq also produces this odd reaction among a lot of young Uyghur. Um, that I, I, I was not in the region then, but I've talked to a lot of people who were, and one of the things that was very commonly said was, when will Bush come and liberate us? Um, so the idea of sort of, the idea, so ironically, the idea of sort of, right. which seems tragic now, but the idea of, uh, that you could be liberated from dictatorship, right. from oppression, was, that was, also, the message they heard? was right. also being quite widely heard. Okay, all right. So then we have, um, well, the Olympics in 2008 and, the, and the, uh, the very widespread uprising across the Tibetan world. And then in 2009, this this thing kicks off in a factory in Shenzhen or yeah. Guangdong Xiao somewhere. Guan. Xiao Guan. Xiao Guan. Xiao Guan. The so so, so pick up that story. So at this point, you have um, you have um, uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of Uyghur who are working in the rest of China, who are working as um, and the whole all of China is moving at this point. There are uh, hundreds of millions of migrant workers going to different areas, and in some places, there's a lot of different conflicts that go on, and um, when there's conflict between uh, Uyghurs and Han Chinese, though, they tended to get a little bit worse because there was the sort of perceived ethnic difference, racial element. So they, there's this morass of rumors in this um, one area where there's a bunch of Uyghur, a bunch of uh, Han, um, in which each side is, is saying, you know, um, a Uyghur man raped a Chinese girl, no, a Chinese man ra raped a Uyghur, all these kind of things are flying around. This creates this sort of anger and dis and that's permeating sort of back through the community. And this erupts in 2009 in this um, riot, um, I think it's the most neutral word we can say in, uh, in Yuranfi, where uh, I um, interviewed a lot of people um, who were witnesses, um, including one of, one of my very close Chinese friend of mine was in the center of town when the riot took place and had to flee for his life. It was, uh, you had a, a fairly s small but extremely angry group of young men who ran riot, who were attacking, um, killing uh, not only Han Chinese, but also uh, some other minorities, Kazakh, Mongol, um, a big explosion of actual violence and sort of, that in turn produced, um, and maybe 200 or so Han Chinese were killed um, and, other, uh, and non Uyghur minorities were killed in that uh, initial violence. So my, my friend, uh, uh, Bruce is his English name, um, Bruce Lee, unfortunately, but... Um, <laughs> you take him aside at some point. He, um, who was, um, uh, in fact, a linguist and uh, 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 speaks Uyghur, which is very unusual, um, spent and lived with Uyghur roommates and uh, was very close, very interested in close to community, was writing his PhD um, pit on uh, Uyghur code switching, under which circumstances they would use their own language, under which circumstances they would speak Chinese, those kind of things. So he's on a bus going in. The bus is overturned by the mob. The uh, bus driver is pulled out and beheaded. Um, he runs for his life. He's holding a watermelon that he's bought uh, at the time, and he throws the watermelon at the men chasing him. Um, because it's the only thing he had to hand. He ends up hiding in a hotel. Now, what then happens is that the People's Armed Police, who are the Chinese sort of paramilitary forces, are deployed to squash the riot. And they, and this is where it starts to get even harder to know what happened, because while there was Chinese reporting on the Uyghur violence, there was almost no Chinese reporting on the counter-violence. And it seems that the People's Armed Police were shooting pretty indiscriminately, that basically if you were a young Uyghur man on the streets... Um, uh, uh, at that time, you were liable to be shot, no matter it, well, you know whether you had been in the riots or not. There also seems to have been quite heavy ethnic retaliation by Han Chinese communities against Uyghur, um, so killings of Uyghur by Han. Now, the government, I've got to say, did try to stomp down on that. They tried to they tried to put a lid on Han violence at that point uh, as much as possible because they could see this situation spiralling. Um, and while they covered it up, they also, I think, did genuinely try to stop it. But it resulted in this complete breakdown of any trust between Han and Uyghur. Um, so, so Bruce, who is, I would should say, also just a sweetheart, I mean, a very gentle, trusting um, man, 
goes goes back and is like, are my Uyghur roommates, who he's lived with for a year, planning to kill me? He be- he says he became like just deeply suspicious. He went to live in the dorm with the Han. And so basically this system, whereas before there had been um, s- there had been the ability to live together, there had been the ability to spend time together within the restraints of a system, of a deeply racist system in which the, the Han were the, uh, held the power, this any kind of trust, any kind of community really is shattered by, by the, uh, the killings. And you, know, you get even, you know, uh, they, and they turn off the internet. The internet is, clo- is shut down through all of Xinjiang. If you want to use the internet, you have to go to um, one of, I think, eight or ten approved sites, and you can look at a, a limited number. I, I mean, physically, you have to go to a police station to be allowed to use the internet, and even then, under very limited conditions. So business starts to suffer. Because you couldn't send an email. You couldn't send an email. You couldn't, um, uh, couldn't do anything. People were, taking, people were trying to keep business alive by taking the train for five or six hours, because Xinjiang is huge, we should emphasize. Taking the train to go to, go to somewhere they could use, um, use the internet. So, and there's, there seems to have been like just sporadic violence throughout, um, throughout the region at that point. Um, and it, the Chinese responses start to become more and more brutal. They start to, and w- again, we're, we're, we're really going by rumor, guesswork, some witnesses. This is a very much kind of black box territory. But one of the patterns you see, for instance, is that the Chinese press starts to report on, occasionally to report on, on what it claims are attacks by Uyghur, and the numbers will be like, you know, one policeman was bruised and 55 terrorists were killed. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, so well, the, the, well, part of the case that the Chinese make is that there have been constant attacks on police stations. I mean, because large incidents don't really get... I mean, I haven't seen that much that would suggest, until we get to Kunming, that would suggest that there was they, a lot of organised violence. Them, they would report them occasionally, but it was very... What they're, claim, what they're claiming now is that there was a uh, so violent and big an insurgency that cr- constituted a serious threat. At yeah. the time, uh, either it didn't exist it, or, it was they, or yeah. they were coming okay. up. Now, right. I will say, when I talked to Chinese terrorism experts about this, they would say we don't know how much violence there is because the local authorities also do not report the extent of the violence to the centre mm. because the local authorities don't want to look as though they've failed. Right. So could it, be true. it could be true, it could be not. I think there probably was... F- if you look at Uyghur language materials from the time, and I don't speak Uyghur, I should hasten to add it, but talking to, talking to people who do, you see an uptick in the sort of level of radicalisation sure. okay. um, and a so sort of call to action. So... This background is obviously one of increasing tensions, increasing s- uh, uh, episodes of violence, increasing migration outwards, and including of prominent figures like Rabia Kadir, who ends up, you know, starts off as the poster child of minority business success and ends up in exile in Washington and so on. But that doesn't quite get us to where we are today. So, I, you know, what is it? When, when did we first start? Being aware well, of these camps and 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 how do we know they're one, there? One step before we get to the camps and a very important step. Um, firstly, you have the uh, there's a an attack in Kunming by yeah. um, by a small number of Uyghur. A railway station. In a railway station where several dozen tri- um, travellers not are uh, stabbed to death, and this becomes a huge. Um, this causes, understandably, a, it's a horrific huge, episode. It's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's an awful incident. It's it's sort of the um, that's the point at which Uyghurs start to be, en masse, forced back from the rest of China to Xinjiang. So you start to see. So the communities elsewhere, um, the police start rounding people up and um, sending them back, forcing them back to Xinjiang. So, so the significance migrants. of it being in Kunming is that it wasn't in Xinjiang, yeah, it, it was in Xinjiang, another outside. And then there was an episode, although a relatively a minor one in Tiananmen. In Tiananmen yeah. um, the car. And this causes, so you have these local authorities now that see Uyghurs all being inherently terrorists, inherently a threat. And this is at a point, too, at which the Chinese political environment is getting more and more tense, is going through its own set of purges. And so nobody wants to give even a little bit of ground, because um, if you have an attack on your... if you. If you don't expel the Uyghur and you 
have an attack, then your political enemies are going to use that to discredit you, and your career is going to be blocked, or you're going to go to jail because they're going to pick, make an example of you for anti-corruption or whatever. So, they, so you have these huge numbers of people forced back to Xinjiang. And I think this is the point at which the violence probably does get worse, because you have enormous numbers of um, young men who, are now, who have now been very clearly shown that they live in a society that hates them, and with authorities that don't trust them. Um, they, something like, I, I would say from my personal experiences and, and from reporting, I'd say something like 90 to 95% of the Uyghur diaspora in China is forced back to Xinjiang. Um, huge and from all over, from, so you see in, in places like uh, Ningxia, which has a big Muslim population, there's lots of Uyghurs studying Islam through official channels at, at official mosques. They're all expelled. You see in Beijing, we could disappear from the streets. There are no more, um, or, uh, no more people no selling, more cake. People selling yeah. cake. No more, um, no more, uh, no more Uyghur kebab vendors, yeah. mm -hmm. no more. Um, very small numbers remain. Um, so, and the state of paranoia becomes total. So I have an acquaintance who is Uyghur Mai Tahan. Um, she tra uh, sh lives in Tianjin, very assimilated, speaks Chinese, half Chinese child. Um, she travels, she goes on a holiday with her son uh, to a sort of coastal resort uh, in, I think it was Shandong, but I, I can't vouch for that. The minute she arrives, because she's registered, she, you know, she, uh, all travel in China is monitored now by train, mm -hmm. by plane, through your national ID card. Sure. The minute she arrives, the police arrive, they immediately put her, and I should never say she's a, you know, she's a middle-aged woman with a sort of small child. She is the least likely terrorist threat in the world. Um, they immediately put her under house arrest. They refuse to let her leave the hotel for the entire week, and then they escort her back to the, and, you know, make sure she gets on the plane to Tianjin. So the, the, uh, so we are just seen as this um, virus, as this terrorist inherent terrorist threat. So, Tarimo, I mean, we, we are now looking at, or we believe we're looking at, one million Uyghur in camps. Now, when did you first start understanding that this was happening? What, what, how did the news get to you? Because, again, this is still a pretty much a black box, you know, in terms of what we know. Yeah, up to the, uh, 2014, the new law... Uh, implement, uh, I mean, I implemented the implemented new law, which new said laws, um, what you cr uh, crack down on terrorism right. and right. Uh, extrajudicial killings right. and right. all all sorts. The situation just got got worse and worse. There is no breathing space for the for the for the Uyghur people. Before it was people who outspoken, they got into trouble. Now they're just any Uyghur, anyone can be sure. a target. So when did and you first in hear 19, uh, I th No, it's 2016. I did hear from some of the Uyghurs when I visited in Turkey uh, that um, they said the situation is get, getting get, getting really bad. Um, and uh, towards the end of uh, 2016, for about one month, uh, my phone, no one would pick up my phone. Because you I, still yeah, have I, family. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I have nine siblings yeah. there. Right. I used to speak to at least one of them every week. And uh, uh, plus, I, um, I, I had cancer in 2013. After I recovered, I mean, during that period and after, my family, my sisters, my, my brothers have to know that I am okay. Every week, if I didn't call them even one, like missed one week, they would be worried. So suddenly, um, no one would pick up my phone. I tried a landline, a mobile phone, and all the, including my friends, that I had numbers. So from no one, one week yes, to another, one, you yeah. couldn't reach anyone? No, for whole month. And then just after New Year, 2017, just after New Year, one day I continuously called my, my eldest brother. His phone was ringing, but no one, but I just continued. Eventually, he picked up the phone. He said, "Way," And that was very strange because- um, Hello in Chinese for yeah, because telephone hello. Always, yeah. he's, uh, he was an imam in, the, in, in one of the largest mosques in, uh, in Rulja, and he always greeted with assalamu alaikum, yeah. you know. 
And uh, when he said way, I was quite surprised. And uh, then uh, it was like pretended that he didn't know me. So I said, oh, why no everyone is not uh, answering the phone? And he said, they did the right thing. And then at that time, his voice was already kind of trembling. And he said, please leave us to God's hand, and we leave you to God's hand, too. So the, the conversation lasted m about two, two, two to three minutes, maybe even not less than that. And immediately, I just put the phone down. After I heard that, and I put the phone down, I was shaking. I just, I, I, I knew there must be such huge threat such a bit really t it could be something really terrible for him to say that to me um, that because he would take any I think he would take any risk but something must be so so terrifying that was two yeah. years ago what and have you learned since and then in uh, for, uh, for in March and April we started Radio Free Asia started reporting about the, uh, the mass arrest of people. And uh, then uh, all the people uh, like me living in, uh, living abroad uh, found out their families being, their family members being taken away. Some, some, pe some journalists from Radio Free Asia, 20 to 30 uh, family members, extended families were arrested and taken. So it's the families of people who are abroad. Uh, who else? Who else is being picked up? Um, I did inter. I did translation. Uh, a lot of translation about these um, conversations between reporter and uh, some of the um, village head. Because Radio Free Asia, um, one of the reporter who is really good at phoning, just phoning up anywhere, and speaking like as if he is a boss. Then th th he can make those people to talk, so to say a, things. It's a very clever technique because what they yeah. basically do is they, they, they never lie. They, very, they follow very strict journalistic ethics. Yeah. But they call up and they say, "I am a journalist and I must have these figures." And they and because they're sp and the local uh, they're from Xinhua or, from or, or, or yeah. whatever, and they, they're like, of course, you know, I'll get you these figures straight away. Yeah, and uh, so uh, in one of the report, and this uh, village head uh, said, um, so that they're targeting people who has family abroad, who traveled abroad, who uh, are religious, who uh, been uh, to Hajj, even like 10 years ago or 15 years e years ago and uh, um, oh you can it's ridiculous reasons there are just so so ridiculous reason and then when he asked how many prayer mats you collected so far and he said 2000 from a village 2000 prayer mats they started confiscating prayer mats um quran yeah. And uh, then it uh, uh, come to the kind of extent that any books that is um, Arabic writing, but for Uyghurs we write in Arabic uh, script. So this is just like step by step, step by step. Is is now can, I can list you thousands of scholars, professors, journalists from a. Uh, Kashgar um, publishing house majority of the of the, of the writers editors gone. Um, Urumqi as well gone. The public intellectuals. I mean, the, this was very clear with Ilham Toti's mm -hmm. very savage sentence mm -hmm. in in when 2013. Quite a while well, ago now, but there, there seems to have been a very deliberate effort to destroy the intelligentsia. Um, so we've seen almost every scholar, writer, poet um, sent to the camps. The reasons given for being sent to the camps uh, are very varied, and it can depend. Um, uh, de uh, for instance, one of the reasons listed in the Human Rights Watch report, which was very good, was buying a tent, because buying a tent, um, that which buying a tent was a sign that you might be planning to join the in join the insurgents in the mountains. 
because you um, or buying too much food because you might be planning to give the food. But so these sort of pra these sort of semi practical but mad paranoid connections, but also uh, following local time instead of Beijing time, because Xinjiang is three hours. Um, two hours. Two hours. Yeah. Mm, two, um, two hours. And um, different from from Beijing time. So that so people there traditionally kept local time. Um, even though that China has one time zone officially, you know the sun doesn't change. Uh, uh, no matter what the Communist Party says, but the <laughs> the um, um, speaking speaking weaker in public, uh, not showing sufficient enthusiasm in uh, under in public displays, with this really sort of Stalinist level of fear and terror, and we we've also seen signs that it, signs that as with Stalinism. It's also deployed for personal vendettas or to take things. So um, Han, we've heard reports of, uh, p of Han threatening to denounce Uyghur colleagues um, to s be sent to the camps if they don't give them their apartment or if they don't, um, give, or if they don't uh, favor them at work or all this kind of thing. So this huge, and we, we, I started to become aware that there was some kind of radical darkening of the situation going on, I would say, later. Um, around the autumn of 2017. By the winter, we knew that there were some, that there were camps had been built, but we thought that the scale was relatively small. By March, we knew that there were camps, and we thought that the number was perhaps 100,000 people. By May, we started getting figures um, that indicated that the scale was uh, as many as a million, perhaps upward of a million. Well, of course, there are people who dispute those figures. I, I mean, apart from in Beijing, where, as we know, these are all perfectly um, acceptable vocational training centres. Um, well, they decided that they were vocational training centres when slightly they late in the day. Yes, when they yes. eventually admitted they existed. Yes, it's but 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 the numbers. I mean, given that we can't go there, given that even if a journalist does go there, they can't get in. What? Where do these numbers come from? So the the numbers are generally derived from two sources. We've had some. Uh, internal documents linked that dis leaked that describe the number of people taken from different areas, or what may be in some cases quotas of targets right. for different areas. And um, there's been good work uh, by Adrian Zenz in particular has done fantastic work as a German scholar, um, putting together these numbers and showing step by step how the figures are assembled. And so you extrapolate. If 10% if of a village goes, you extrapolate. He, it's much, the, the extrapolation Roughly. is relatively limited. Okay. I mean, um, he, he's put together document, um, a number of documents to get to you know, a reasonably solid figure. And then we've been able to literally see it, because there's satellite images of the camps. And so we've seen this massive expansion, just these huge sites being built out of nothing in the desert, or being, in some cases, taking schools or um, athletic grounds and converting them into the detention centers where you can see the guard towers, you can see the barbed wire. And at the same time, I should emphasize that the camps are merely the most horrifying manifestation of the uh, total surveillance and control of Xinjiang. That you also have uh, checkpoints everywhere, um, facial recognition systems that don't work very well, but that um, th are part of sort of the threatening. A uh, huge police presence. The entire area is lo is massively locked down. There's huge amounts of security spending s on this, sure. and control of travel through and control of travel through not being able to buy totally petrol or train yeah, tickets or yeah, whatever. Yeah, but yeah. A, a totally militarized border. Mm. Um, you have um, hundreds of thousands of Han have been dispatched to live with Uyghur in their homes and to monitor them and to attempt to force assimilation upon them. So, for instance, by demanding that they eat pork. Um, by demanding that they, uh, so this this total surveillance, this total monitoring, and the atmosphere of fear um, from is almost absolute. And we've seen, you can see from pictures, you can see empty areas. You can see places where, in particular, young men have virtually disappeared. You can see um, places. You can see mosques that have emptied out, where only very old men attend. Um, you can see how uh, you can see the bookstores that have been completely cleared, where the, the, literally the shelves where previously there were a Uyghur language section are now empty. Um, so all, so um, the, the control, the, the fear and the, and the 
um, intimidation is absolute. I'm still puzzled. Two things puzzle me. Why now? Why, you know, we have Belt and Road going through Xinjiang. Is that connected? We have... And, and how does this end? I mean, do they let people out? How many people have got out? What, what, what is the process? I think... Um, firstly, I think why now... I think, I think it's just taken time. I think it's been coming for a while. I think, it, I think that the fears, both as the security state expanded within China as a whole anyway as the power of the security forces has massively grown under Xi Jinping, and as the fears from, that sprung from the Arab Spring, from, um, from the sense of losing sort of ideological battles from the, um, grew, it, almost in retrospect it seems like this was always a possible move. And it, that it's happened now I don't think is the result of any one incident or um, movement. I think it's just a, a sort of outgrowth of existing policy in a way. And as for, uh, as for releases, there have been very limited releases, and they've, and they've almost all been, uh, occasionally it's been of people who are politically connected or able to, able to exert some kind of pressure. So we've had, so I've known a couple of uh, a Uyghur who returned to China on holiday from being graduate students, were, imp uh, were imprisoned and then were able to get out because they had an uncle in the security forces or this kind of thing. Um, most of the releases have been Kazakh or other um, or, or other non Uyghur Because of pressure, the pressure from Kazakhstan. From Kazakhstan and, yeah. and other governments. Um, but many of these people are being released not into freedom. Some are being released to Kazakhstan and elsewhere. Many are being released not into freedom, but into other parts of the penal system. So we're starting to see a lot of forced labor, for instance, a lot of people being sent to basically sweatshops, mm -hmm. garment factories, and so on. So Rima, what, what's been your experience of, of releases of, of people who are able somehow to tell of their experience? A majority of them, actually, the foreign nationals. The very first, right. yeah, the very first uh, man was from the Kaza uh, Kazakhstan, and uh, he originally from, uh, from the Uyghur region, and he gained uh, Kazakhstan citizenship in 2010, and he has been traveling uh, between Almata and uh, Urumqi doing business and he was working for a tourist company and uh, in I, I did uh, translate his uh, very first time that was in January 2018 I think uh, they about he is the first person who actually there were, there, no no there were there have been others before them I published somebody in March of 2006 Oh, no, no, March. Okay. No, you're right, March 2018. Yes, <laughs> 2000, uh, yeah, Janu now. Yeah, January 2018. Mm -hmm. um, I think about uh, one month after his release, he was uh, well enough to speak to a journalist. He actually contacted the Radio for Asia and uh, uh, he gave it away, everything, all what happened to him. Um, and from how he described, he, first he was taken to prison. Um, seven months were chained on a bed. Um, and then uh, after the um, uh, Kazakh uh, embassy uh, intervened, I think, uh, also there were a lot of pressure from their family and his wife campaigned for his release. Eventually he was released from prison to one of these so-called education camps. So he spent about 23 days in that camp. So he's the first person could uh, uh, told the world that what is like being in there is completely just like a prison. And if he, they, they, they were forced to, to, sing, uh, to sing red songs before they can, uh, they can have their meal. And they must, uh, instead of like for Uyghurs, we do prayers, but you they have to pray, long live Xi Jinping, and uh, uh, unbelievable. It's mm. it, it looks like, or it sounds like worse than Cultural Revolution. I mean, I have translated the book, Re The Land Drenched in Tears, and uh, it's about this uh, Tatar woman who was arrested in 1950, uh, 1960s mm -hmm. uh, from the university, medical university, three years imprisonment, then during the Cultural Revolution, he was on the s she was under surveillance 
and regime and the, all this uh, horrific uh, detail of how she was uh, was beaten up and but if you look at what is happening now even I was speaking to her the other day um, and she said what I hear is is, is far worse mm -hmm. than what I have experienced very many I think I think we, we need oh, to could, could, I, could I make one quick yes quick one thing? quick one one quick point just to say that um, very many of the people in the camps are elderly um, because in many cases they've been taken in, lo in as a sort of substitute or threat against their children and so a lot of the people in the camps are in their 60s 70s 80s um, and uh, um, when we've heard of deaths, it's often of older people who have not b had access to medicine, not had access to proper care, have been under physical stress. Um, and this seems to be, you know, the, this targeting in particular of family members is very strong, um, and the use of family members as a threat against others. Yeah. Um, China's paid a very little price for this diplomatically to date. I think Turkey was the first country formally to protest as the result of what turns out perhaps to be an inaccurate uh, report of the death of a very well-known musician. Do you expect that, the, the, that there will be an international response to this at some point? I think we're seeing a response from the US, but it's difficult to distinguish from the general shift yeah, yeah. against mm -hmm. China as part of geopolitical, as part of both um, so realization of sort of genuine threat and geopolitical mm. c um, competition. But other than Turkey, Islamic countries have been There's remarkably the silent. So in some Islamic countries, we've seen the opposition taking up this cause and using it to bash the government in power. So in, in Indonesia, for instance, the Indonesian elections are coming up and the, um, some of the opposition parties have been using this to sort of go after the government for being too close to China. But the big danger there is what we've, we've seen before, that these opposition movements very often will take up a anti-China stance when they're out of power, yeah. and then will drop it once they're in power. And not a peep out of Pakistan. Indeed, notable silence there. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, it's your turn. Um, uh, please wait for the microphone and tell us who you are. Um, and uh, please include a question in your question. Uh, my name is my name's Alan Taylor. I remember flying back from Hong Kong, might have been 10 years ago, with a group of uh, oil engineers from um, Xinjiang, uh, describing the absolute anarchy uh, that prevailed there and the massive control of the area by drug barons and the in inability of Beijing to control uh, these people. But um, looks like um, China has um, Beijing stepped in with massive... Question um, please, Alan. <laughs> um, what will compel Beijing to change their policy? Will it be massive discoveries of oil or economic pressure? They have oil. Looks like political pressure wouldn't work. I think... Um, um, I think the most realistic possibility is pressure from Islamic countries and a winding that forces some winding down of the, ma of the worst of the camp system, but I think it's extremely unlikely that the security state will be rolled back until we see significant political change. I don't mean regime collapse, but an end to Shiism um, at the top in China. I also think it's quite likely that um, we might start to see radical new steps, such as, for instance, um, much more moving of, the c of inmates into forced labor or attempts to break up the Uyghur population by sending them to different parts of China. But that's very politically hard. Right, gentlemen. Yeah, um, th thank you both very much for extremely moving um, address. Uh, the name's Ewan Grant. I'm a former customs intelligence analyst. I was working in Bishkek at uh, the time of the Olympics and the attacks on the border uh, HQ inside the border and the closure of the border. Um, I have two short questions. One is, um, do you have any comments to make about the composition of the audience tonight and the fact that there seems to be very, very few Han Chinese in the audience? And secondly, regarding the gentleman's comment about what he was told by the oil engineers, um, do you believe 
that those people were telling the truth or were they saying what they had to say to keep their jobs because although there is a drugs problem it's not that scale and out of control thank you um, regarding there is not there are not many um, chinese among the audience um, actually, we did one uh, one conference last Saturday. In uh, uh, it was organised by the Hong Kong uh, student Depa uh, Hong Kong uh, department in K Cambridge. We had about ninety percent, uh, uh, almost ninety percent Chinese, uh, also including some students from mainland. And uh, uh, what encouraged me or made me um, happy was uh, qu quite few of them stood up and said what do you expect us to do what can we do um the, 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 the um what can we do to help the situation um and uh, um one problem is that the even the chinese people in china they they are not aware of what is happening they because the news is is completely um you know so, so secret everything is 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 so secret i also heard that a lot of chinese actually left uh, xinjiang uh, uh, according to one of my friend who worked in um uh, in in urumqi um uh, uh, he said actually from the the start of the of the camp system up until uh, last year he left there were estimated 50 60000 people left left Urumqi, the Chinese left Urumqi because the business got yeah. very bad as well because of the there were not many Uyghurs on, on, street, on, on the street. Also regarding the uh, second question, I would uh, believe um, people in, in China, if, including myself when I was there, uh, there are things that we were told how we say to the, 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 uh, the especially uh, people from uh, foreign countries. So you were I told <laughs> what you were supposed <laughs> to tell yes. them. Yes. I, I worked one summer, uh, summer um, English training, uh, training class. I was an assistant teacher for one of the American students who came to teach uh, intensive English class in Karmai. And I had to go through two weeks uh, political study um, and that, that was in 19, uh, 1998 or 97. We have to, all the assistant teacher have to ha go through two weeks political studies before we can, we, we can um, and we were told everything, how we, what we can say, what we cannot. I would say too, there's every chance that they genuinely believe that because the level of rumor about crime in Xinjiang yes. among the Han is also very strong and the belief that, that, that Uyghur criminals is very strong so it may it could well be that they were told to say it, it could also be that they sincerely believed it in the way that say uh, a Trump voter from rural Iowa believes that New York is the m is you know strewn with bodies or that all Mexicans are rapists or whatever gentlemen there Hi, thank you uh, my name is Adam Knight I'm a journalist producer with Al Jazeera uh, covering kind of China related issues um, in my experience covering this kind of topic and researching it, when engaging with Chinese journalists or indeed ordinary Chinese citizens, um, there's often a blend of curiosity around the subject with denial or perhaps justification. Um, my question really is what have your experiences been in engaging with Chinese journalists specifically uh, and how can we as journalists have a productive, constructive conversation with uh, Chinese, within the constraints of the Chinese media basically? Thank you. I think it's, I mean, I worked in the Chinese media for a long time, and worked with, I've worked extensively with Chinese journalists. Um, I think it would have been possible to have a conversation about this that was productive in 2012 or 2011. Not, um, I, don't, I think it's impossible to have that conversation now because the limits under which Chinese journalists operate are so strong. I think in terms of engaging with Chinese, in terms of getting people to, to recognize the camps, to, to to sort of break through the levels of denial on them. Um, and I was, one of the things that's most effective is testimony from um, assimilated Uyghur, because it's pointing to people who are married to um, Chinese, who speak Chinese, 
because that's more recognizable to them, it brings it home more. It, and I think um, it's very hard, it's very hard for people to accept that their government is capable of something that's awful. It's, there's also massive Islamophobia in China right now, and that's really difficult to engage with, because one of the immediate pushbacks you'll get is, but these people are terrorists. These people, you know, the West doesn't take our suffering seriously. So it's very important to acknowledge the suffer that there has been, there have been terrorist attacks, that there has been suffering, to recognize that and say, but, you know, are, a million people are not terrorists, to say, or, or to point to, to say, is this making it better or worse? Is this making... Uh, but we've seen this huge and very disturbing rise in Islamophobia um, throughout Chinese society, and not just with Uyghur, but with attacks on other Muslim groups, with the closure of mosques in uh, other parts of China, anti-religious campaigns, not just against Islam, but particularly against Islam. Um, attacks, I've heard from Hui Muslims of attacks on people in Hui dress, of windows being smashed in restaurants. Uh, when Perhaps you should explain that Hui are, are, the are Chinese, Muslim Chinese Muslims. Chinese yeah. Muslims, big, biggest, tri biggest, support, biggest group of Chinese Muslims, the Hui. They, um, there's a big worry in the community that they may be next. And one of the weirdest things has been seeing this is that these Islamophobic stories originating in the West and coming back into China through different forms of social media. And I think pinpointing those, addressing those, um, can also be very useful in engaging with Chinese, saying, where does the story come from? Who's spreading it? Why are they spreading it? Uh, Lady there. Hi, um, it's Sophia from Ground Truth Productions. Uh, my question is, two countries that are very good at surveillance, Israel and China. Is there a tie or a link with Israel, I wonder? Uh, there absolutely, um, alas. Uh, um, so the Public Security University, which is the um, Public Security University, which is the main uh, uh, university dealing that does the theory of this kind of stuff in Beijing, has made a big effort to hire people from the is from the private sector in Israel who had experience um, in Palestine. Um, people, uh, ex Shin Bet people, um, ex army people, big. They they hired a uh, I think at least half a dozen of them about three or four years ago. Um, there's also some evidence, there also seem to be some companies, not just Israeli, but surveillance companies in general, that have uh, contracted in Xinjiang. Uh, Eric Prince's company, Blackwater, most notoriously. Um, but very much the, exp but they, they were definitely very aware, and when I was talking to Chinese anti-terrorism experts, they were very aware of the Israeli experience, they were very keen on learning from it. Um, and there was a, a real effort to try and contact and reach um, Israeli experts and bring them in, and particularly uh, in the sort of private security sector. Can I sneak one in? Yes. Do you think there's any anxiety in the Chinese population that these methods will travel out of Xinjiang? I don't think that the Chinese population thinks in Xinjiang in those terms yet. And when they do, they think of it in terms of them being terrorists or bad people. There's plenty of anxiety in China about growing oppression, growing su surveillance, growing censorship, but it's not no, seen as coming from Xinjiang. Uh, uh, my name is Moin Yassin. I'm from an uh, Islamic think tank, Global Vision 2000. Two points. I think it's important to bring out in the open the concept of Chinese colonialism. I didn't hear much about it. For instance, uh, after I did some research, in 1933, in 1944, apparently, there was two successful uprisings called the East Turkestan Yes, Islamic. we did cover that, actually. I didn't hear much about it. But uh, so obviously, the whole history post that needs to be brought up because there's a whole baggage here. Secondly, and more importantly, uh, bringing this problem back home, this problem of Islamophobia here, there, everywhere, We've tracked it. I think in the modern era, since 9-11 in particular, that whole process has got to be deconstructed because it is providing a cover globally for non-Muslim regimes of all sorts to attack Muslim populations. Now, this is going to have a reaction 
Thank and you, it sir. is having a reaction. I'd like to hear what the panel has got to say about that. The deconstruction of the global war on terror, which is targeting Islam and Muslims. Yeah, I think absolutely we have to, we have to say that uh, Western Islamophobia, Islamophobia everywhere connects in the same way there's, as racism everywhere to some degree connects. Um, that um, one of the first steps, especially if we're going to be confronting China on this diplomatically, is to address Islamophobia at home so that we're um, so that we can't have these accusations throw ba thrown back at us. Uh, and I'd, I'd add, too, that it's exceptionally important, for, especially as we have a racist U.S. administration at the moment, to, uh, to distinguish between the Chinese government and the party state and the Chinese people, um, many of whom, uh, and many of whom, um, when given the opportunity, when they have the chance, have sp uh, are, will speak up in defense, will... Uh, will try and play a positive role in this, but who also suffer under a regime of fear and oppression. And from uh, my own experience, just uh, looking at how this, uh, the faith developed o o over the years, I think uh, what happens is when you have too much oppression, when you tell people not to do something, when you completely take away um, all their what they have, and I think I it's quite um, easy for people to turn to something what is, you know what I mean. Yeah. And also, um, I have uh, m many times I was asked this question. I said, the Chinese government have the power, have all the resources to crack down those who are who are responsible. They have the power, they have the manpower, intelligence, everything. But they don't, but they go after when there is one person, one person attacked something. Then they go after the whole family, whole relatives, people who have any kind of connection. And this cannot, they cannot, they cannot justify this, just how they uh, in turning million or maybe more, we don't know the uh, number, uh, the Uyghur exile group estimating could be up to three million. So in, in whichever way that China claim that they suffer, also share this Islamic ter terrorist um, problem, but there is no way it can ju justify, justify this. Uh, yes, lady. Um, my name's Annie Land. I'm, I visited the province in 2016. Um, We've heard that obviously it's an economically and geographically important region for China, but this security policy must be having a destructive impact on it. So what I'm interested to know is how it fits into a wider policy that the Chinese government has towards the region. What other steps is it taking that kind of will develop the region in, in its own form in, to counter this security assault? It was at one point targeted as a tourist destination. It was, yes. It? There was an attempt um, attempt to, in 2015, 2016, mm. I think there was this big propaganda push that was like, everything is peaceful, please come camping in Xinjiang. Lovely yeah. Xinjiang. Um, Just don't buy a tent. <laughs> one, one, of the things we've, one of the things we've absolutely seen across the country is a deprioritization of economic concerns uh, as opposed to security or, ideo or ideological ones. And this is having... This is one of the reasons for the current slowdown is the, the economic pressure being put on by this mass securitization project throughout China. So, and while there's pushback on that, the security forces are still the ones running the show. So we've seen, um, so you're seeing these sort of, um, they're, you know, big mineral development, oil extraction programs going on in Xinjiang, um, but, they're, but they're still paying a price in securitization. They're paying a premier for staff because people don't want to move there. They're, but there doesn't seem to be there doesn't seem to be the ability to push back against the security state even within the Chinese state right now, um, and it looks like um, in terms of just the construction of the camps, um, th these are incurring debt bur burdens for local governments, which are a big problem throughout China, and that seems to be accelerating as a result of just the costs being imposed. So I think that while there's while there are lots of people who want um, to try and run these economic development programs, who, who want, it's basically impossible to take the steps that would actually ensure it at the moment. Because for one thing, um, you know, your your consumers are in jail, or 
There's also the, well, there is the major development program which is Belt and Road. Oh, Belt. You know, and the idea, you know, that seamlessly from China through Central Asia, there would be manufacturing mm -hmm. hubs, communications hub. How does this fit? It doesn't look very promising, does it? They call it the stability. Stability, because yes, stability I, yes. Because in locking up over a million people, they're achieving the stability. Yes. And uh, they keep saying that now we don't have any any attacks. Look how, how wonderful mm. they, they, they It's they not they quite the same as an open economy, though, is it? Or at least an open kind of well, trading uh, regime. One of the things that we actually seem to be seeing is some export of the techniques developed in Xinjiang to other countries uh -huh. through the Belt and Road. So we're right. seeing it in Pakistan, for instance. Pakistan is adopting around, I forget, what's the port? Guad 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 Guadal. 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 Yeah. Guadal. So right down at the bottom of Sipa. Yeah, so yeah. around in a, uh, a zone around Guadal, there's, um, they're attempting to adopt um, GPS te tracking techniques for cars, for instance. Because also it's not just, you know, you have um, uh, obviously militancy and um, resistance all through these sort of potential regions. And the, the uh, Pakistani state is very keen on uh, taking up maybe not the camps, but some of the technology of Xinjiang. Okay, now we're really getting close to the end, and this always happens, the entire audience puts their hand up. I'm going to take three or four at a time, so the lady there, and then there's a lady there. Go Hi, um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Flora McFarlane, okay. and I think just to bring it back uh, to a more fundamental uh, aspect to all of this, a lot has been talked about assimilation, but in my mind, it's not clear. Like, where does that is that an end objective to completely ideologically change the Uyghur? Is it uh, is there an end point? You're saying almost a whole generation is disappeared. Okay, um, we're going to have to take two or three questions at a time, and you're going to choose. There's a lady there with a the dark hair, then. and then another one at the back row. Hi, thanks. Um, Charlotte Middlehurst. I'm a journalist, and um, I wanted to pick up on James's point about the role of technology in all of this. And the surveillance that we're seeing seems to be a blend of old techniques and then quite new, sophisticated techniques. The facial recognition technology, for example, I don't think we've seen that deployed on the, on the scale that it is being deployed. And I wonder, is there evidence that this new security apparatus is being exported? And what can Western journalists do to um, throw more light on this? Are they doing enough? Okay, one, and we'll take one more from the back. So we've got assimilation technology. Okay, it's been well documented that the top party boss in um, Xinjiang, Chen Quanguo, uh, trialed these technologies in Tibet before, and uh, that relates to the issue of surveillance tech, generally the uh, combination of um, deep securitization with um, re-education um, in, in uh, reflecting Xi Jinping's current focus on uh, ideology um, very strongly and using these uh, techniques which they describe as conversion. So it's a much more, it's a much deeper, deeper level. Um, and also in terms of the surveillance tech just mentioned by the previous questioner, the Hick vision cameras that are now being used in the camps were trialed on the Qinghai Tibet Railway back in 2006, 2007. Um, and the UK is actually one of the biggest overseas markets for these Hick vision cameras, which also involved in the um, facial rec recognition technology. So two, two quick questions. One of them is, uh, does the panel have any uh, comments on the specific role of Chen uh, Quanguo in uh, Xinjiang? And secondly, Bitter Winter reported that um, thousands possibly of Uyghurs are being moved in the dead of nights from camps in Xinjiang to camps in other provinces of China. And I wonder if you had any comment on that. Thank you. Yes. Um, about assimilation, obviously the Chinese government cannot tolerate any, any different voices or even a different language now. Uh, because in their uh, view, that uh, for them to uh, make you become just one of them, not only you speak the language or um, not to believe any religion, but also you have to think the same as them. 
you know, the thought reform, and that that has always uh, a long history since, especially the since the Commun communist party. And we don't forget also the the people Falun Gong. They were they were Chinese, and they were uh, uh, suffered for years because they were different. So on, on assimilation, I can, I, can, I can say that. Uh, I also heard uh, Xi Jinping visited uh, Kashgar in 2015, and he never been to Xinjiang in, in his life. And after he came back, he was furious. He was furious. He said, how these people never changed, how they're still wearing different clothes and speaking different language. You've been there for so long. Why this has not changed? So they use this kind of very aggressive uh, policies. They said they must change. That it has to be changed. James, technology. Uh, yeah, the Chen the, um, the ideological goals have been very clear, clearly laid out in Chinese documents. I would add it's very ex expressly saying that they, you know, using using the language of total of conversion of control, all this sort of thing. Um, it's not just not just obviously the obviously Uyghur extreme example, but I would add that there's this big shift as a whole towards ethno nationalism in China, towards Han dominance. We're seeing other minority peoples' um, lang uh, language schools being closed down, to, uh, c uh, cultural institutes threatened, all this kind of thing. Technology. One of the big things has been the use of algorithmic techniques to identify supposed threats, which has the same problem that any data project does, and that it act, tends to amplify existing biases. Um, but it, within a paranoid security system, it also makes it harder and harder to resist that. If the system, if the computer tells you that somebody is a potential threat because they connect to X number of other people, mm -hmm. then you cannot make, uh, in, inside a paranoid environment, you cannot be the one who says the computer is talking rubbish, this person is 75. <laughs> um, and that's a huge problem, and that's going to be a problem throughout the rest of China as these systems, as and as the government becomes more and more obsessed with and uh, dangerously uncontrolled in its use of big data, just as it's been a problem in the West, but in the West, at least w we have had institutions that have been able to choke this back or, or pull this off at various points, though not always successfully. Uh, on cameras, there's been some excellent reporting. Um, there should be more. Uh, I'm always happy to, to publish it. We've had one of the things has been um, uh, Hick, uh, Hick vision, also the expansion of these techniques to um, Venezuela, to uh, Zimbabwe, and other countries in order to try and build up um, data for facial recognition with yeah. more ethnic variety. Uh, on Tibet, yeah, it very much seems that Tibet was a trial for these techniques. Um, it, it, it makes me, obviously Tibet and Xinjiang have always been the extreme examples, but there's also a sense among observers that some of this is going to move into greater China. Some of it already has in terms of securitization. I uh, was told recently, for instance, that um, before a music festival venue could be allowed to be held, the police demanded that uh, an entire uh, camera system be installed, linked up with facial recognition to the central police database. I would also add these facial recognition systems don't actually seem to work very well from the evidence that we have. Um, and there's huge problems with them that, again, are just going to get worse. On which happy note, I know you have lots of questions. Yeah. I could encourage you to go to the bar, where I think you probably at least find James and perhaps Rahimi for a little while. Moving prisoners, quickly, yes. I just would like to uh, make comments about regarding moving prisoners. We did hear a lot about the people being moved uh, to uh, the neighboring uh, neighboring places. And we never thought uh, that uh, Uyghurs would be moved to Heilongjiang province, which is, you know, if anyone know China, they, 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 Xinjiang or East Turkestan is in the, in the one, yeah. on the one other side, extreme. it is yeah. complete mm -hmm. other, uh, other extreme. And uh, I just wanted to share uh, this. Um, one day, a friend of mine uh, just called me and said, Rahima, uh, I had a friend, I, m I met a Chinese couple who are, who are, uh, who are from Thailai uh, County of Heilongjiang. And I asked them uh, what they think about what is happening in, in Xinjiang. And then they said, oh, there are too many terrorists there. And then recently, there were a lot of terrorists uh, being moved to uh, Thailai uh, prison. Uh, 
and that just came kind of accidental, accidental um, kind of conversation that came. So I then I contacted quite a lot of other other uh, sources to uh, just investigate if that is true. Eventually, it, it has been confirmed more than twenty, uh, more than two thousand Uyghurs or in moved in to, yeah in in Heilongjiang Thai 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 uh, prison. And, and if uh, that's happening, we can assume that other places. Of also course, if they if that can happen to that uh, Thai Lai prison actually is uh, one of the most uh, like infamous for uh, uh, the Falun Gong, they used to, used uh -huh. to keep the fa 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 Falun Gong practitioners, and uh, apparently the the, the uh, guards, prison guards, rebelled and asked for pay rise. They said, "We well, now we are dealing with uh, well, top terrorists, and we 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 need we need to have pay rise." And this was all. Uh, come yeah, cheap. Uh, yeah. Uh, we really do have to stop. I'm very sorry. I've learned a lot, and I could happily go on um, uh, talking uh, for, for much longer. But I think we would be straining the patience of the of the Frontline Club. But um, please join me in thanking James and Rahima for a really <laughs> splendid enlightening. Time. And thank you to you for being here. Um, as I say, I'm sure. Uh, that you, if you were to stroll down to the bar, you might encounter another opportunity for a question. <laughs>